I suppose I need to be honest with you this morning and say that there was a time that I did not like nor hardly ever read the Gospel of Matthew because of this text. Oh, come on, folks. I mean, there's still turkey in our refrigerators. And some of us still have unwrapped gifts underneath the tree. And now this. Have you read this? It's one of the most depressing texts in all the Bible. Listen to it as Marge, as Marge reads this, what I think is a depressing text. And ask yourself, is there something else? Is there something else other than what Matthew is presenting that Matthew wants us to know? I think, thankfully, there is. Be seated. Please be seated. Today's gospel is found in the second chapter of St. Matthew. Now, after the wise men went away, had left, uh, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I call you. For Herod is about to seek for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to Egypt by night, and remained there until the death of Herod. Now this was to fill, fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Now when, when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. So he was sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under according to the time that he had learned from the wise man. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. Well. When Herod had died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in, in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are seeking the life of the child are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after having been warned in a dream, he went away to, well, the district of Galilee. And there he made his home in the city of Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. And he will be called a Nazarene, the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Did I tell you? Let's pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, so much for Camelot. Guess it's back to the real world. It was nice while it lasted, but it didn't last. Santa's back in the North Pole. The shepherds are back to shepherding. There's no evidence of swaddling clothes anywhere in the room. And then Herod shows up, scared, spitless, that he's about to lose his power and will do anything in the world to save it. So Jesus has to flee all the way to Egypt to save his life. Herod is infuriated, kills every male child two years of age and younger. You can't make this stuff up. 
The real world seems to intrude into silent night, holy night, so quickly that it's almost like a dream. Tell me there's something more. Because on the surface, there's, this is about as sad a story in the Bible as you'll ever want to hear. But go back and pay a little more attention to what Matthew is trying to say. And I think hints appear just below the surface of something else. Who was, who was Jesus' father, earthly father's first name? And the angel appeared to Joseph, how? And where does, is Jesus taken to avoid Herod? Does that sound familiar? <clears throat> Matthew's community would have thought so they would have remembered another story of another Joseph whose great gift was the interpreting of where? Do you see what Matthew is doing? Matthew is reminding his community and us of the Exodus. Of a time when God sends Moses to another king, Pharaoh, and God parts the Red Sea and destroys the Egyptian army and leads God's people out to the promised land. Matthew wants his listeners and us to be clear that it is that God who destroyed who? Pharaoh will one day destroy Herod. That in between and below and underneath the surface of this horrible, vindictive, violent story is the story of love and grace. That in every generation, God has come to destroy whatever tyrant seems to be in rule, not only in Matthew's community, but in ours. I'd like to read for you what I think are the two most important verses in this text. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are seeking the child's life are what? They're dead. Herod died. They all die. Every one of them. Hitler. Stalin. Bin Laden, Kim Jong-un, or whatever his name is. Every one of them, they die. And you know as well as I know that the names of, of tyrants in this world are not limited to people. Cancer, job loss, unemployment, addictions, dementia, loneliness, the list, folks, can go on and on. But in the midst of all of that, one day, like Herod, it will all be gone. One day, every tear will be riped dry. One day, that world just below the surface in Matthew's gospel will surface. And God's love and grace will be clear for all to see. How does Matthew know that? Because there is not, has not, and never will be a tyrant who rules this world. This, rule, this world, hear me folks, is ruled by a God of love and grace who brings that love and grace into every corner of this world and into every person in it, no matter what we face. So I go back to the one word of Christmas, and I think Matthew wants us to remember that word. It's his word, Emmanuel. 
God with us. I think Matthew wants his people and ours to cling to that word the way God clings to us. I think Matthew wants us to know this simple truth, that God is with us, every one of us, and that God is our manger. And in spite of all the devastating evidence to the contrary, it is God and not Herod who has us in the palm of his hands. Blessed be he.